What's going on everyone? Sam Rothstein here, acting principal clarinet with the Indianapolis Symphony Orchestra, bringing you another episode of the Candid Clarinetist podcast. We have a great show planned for you today as I've invited my friend Danny Beckley on the podcast. Danny is the executive director of the Kansas City Symphony, having been in that position since July of 2019. Prior to his appointment in Kansas City, Danny and I got to know each other during his time as vice president and general manager of the Indianapolis Symphony. In my opinion, Danny has always been at the forefront in terms of pushing orchestras in new directions with his passion for technology and streaming initiatives, something that he, uh, it was definitely a pet project of his in Indianapolis, and he's continued that in Kansas City. Uh, I thought it would be interesting to have a conversation with him and find out what his thoughts are on where orchestras are headed in both the near and distant future. Danny, thank you so much for joining me today to discuss these important topics. Yeah, thanks, Sam. I really appreciate being with you. Yeah, absolutely. So I know that uh, you went to school as a trombone performance uh, major. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> In a formal I, life? <laughs> <laughs> well, it feels that way, but yes. yeah. Um, so how did you first become interested in a career in orchestra management? You know, it's an interesting story. So I, I had a dream just like just like you and, and you've you know you realized your dream but uh, of being a, a bass trombonist in a major orchestra and uh, and so I had the pleasure of attending Northwestern for a performance degree and mm-hmm. studying with members of Chicago Symphony and having all of the richness that comes from being in an environment like that uh, I moved to Charleston um, after my performance degree uh, my wife at the time uh, lived there her family was there and so it was a nice place to just establish home base. Uh, I was running a business at the time, so I could really live anywhere. Uh, and we were in kind of market acquisition mode. So really any market, um, th- there were a number of places I could have lived. And Charleston was certainly ripe uh, with opportunity. Mm-hmm. At the time, I was running a software company. And okay. that was supporting my my music habit, I say, yes, uh, right. to, to support me and, and, and give me the freedom and flexibility to be able to take auditions, uh, to play with different orchestras in the southeast. I was playing with the Charleston Symphony Orchestra at the time uh, as a you know an extra substitute musician, and that orchestra was going through absolute hell. It, it was yeah. terrible. Uh, they were really on the brink of uh, bankruptcy. Uh, it was uh, they they were about to just close up shop. Um, the musicians asked me if I would consider joining the board, given my music background and also my business background, uh, and so I did. And I got very involved in that to the point that the board asked me then to step in as the CEO of that orchestra. Uh, in 2010, I hadn't really thought about a career in orchestra management at all prior to that. Mm-hmm. It was really a matter of seeing my friends, you know, really being threatened with the loss of their livelihoods and knowing that there could be a solution out there. Um, and so really being able to throw myself into music full time, which is ultimately what I wanted to do as a, a trombonist anyway, um, that was a very alluring opportunity. And so I, I did. I jumped off that cliff and and that's how I got into the field. Well, I, actually, I had no idea that you were on the board of the Charleston Symphony. I knew that you, that prior to coming to Indianapolis that you were the ex- executive director of Charleston, but I didn't know sort of the path that took you there. And that's that's really fascinating. And I think, um, you know, this is something that I've thought about a lot, too. Uh, I love performing, and I don't think my performing career is done yet, but I've, I've certainly entertained the idea of of at some point in time, you know, shifting and going more towards the management side. And for you, you know, the motivation for me is similar. It's not so much to like, you know, uh, some, someone's on the brink of disaster or bankruptcy and all my friends are are threatened. It's more just like, I feel like I could have more of an impact on the career that I am passionate and I love, uh, doing something that affects an organization in totality rather than just like playing on stage. Um, Mm -hmm. cause you know, we're very, uh, Obviously, it takes a lot of work and effort to perform at a high level, but I feel like my impact, you know, as the bass clarinetist or the acting principal clarinetist is is minimal uh, to where if I was in management, it could be a more of a, a, a major impact. And I don't know if that's kind of how you felt about it um, or if you just kind of like, you know, the, the opportunity presented itself and, and, and it was something that you were interested in. Yeah, I mean, I I would have given my left arm for a for a big orchestra job right. um, back then, and and you have one, and <laughs> so yeah. to, you know, I, I I certainly understand the the point of view that that it's it's easier to impact change when you're when you're leading an organization versus being one of you know seventy or eighty musicians sitting on stage, um, but but really I I think you you and your your peers you know the the thought leadership that you've exhibited in the field just over the last during the pandemic really. Uh, you've, you've really, um, 
started to really speak out about things and 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 have a really logical and sensible uh, place that you come at uh, at issues from. I think you could have influence, big influence, in either management or as a musician. And our success as an industry really depends on musicians being more than, you know, being more than playing on stage, uh, doing going out in the community, but being also part of the solution building. All of us need yeah. to recognize that this this field is not going in a good direction right now. And we need to work together. Um, so whichever side of the side of the table, as it were, that you're sitting on, um, all of us have to row together to, to solve this, to solve these issues. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think you really hit the nail on the head with that, because one of the thing, one of the things that people say that always makes me cringe is uh, they pull the that's not my job card. And, and I'm like, well, if we don't do something about it now, it's it, it, you won't have a job. <laughs> Yeah. So, so we all need to get on board here and, and affect the necessary change. Otherwise, it's, you know, it's not a matter of, uh, you know, it's it's not my job. I mean, it's all of our jobs to engage audiences. It's all of our jobs to, uh, you know, push artistic boundaries. It's all of our jobs to help raise money because uh, that's yeah. that's just that's what it is. Otherwise, we're not going to have a job. And so, I think the the our positions and our jobs are really kind of shifting to include more of that. Um, just just for our own personal sake of, of longevity in this field and, uh, transitioning from, from that. I think that uh, a lot of people aren't aware. Uh, I know I wasn't until I took an arts management class in, in, at school, but can you just describe kind of the business model of an orchestra? Cause it's very, it's not what people think. Um, and mm. so, so if you could just sort of briefly describe, you know, how, how the, the funds are raised and, and the money kind of, uh, funnels itself to a, a solvent organization. So I'll, I'll say first, mission and business are not the same thing. Um, they, they mean different things. And so our mission is, as an orchestra, whatever orchestra you're in, and your mission probably includes something like artistic excellence and community and impact and those kind of things. Um, our mission is to perform this music. But our business is to build an audience for it and sustain an audience for symphonic music. And so we have been doing a fairly lousy job <laughs> at yes. the business side of things for a long, long time. Uh, we being the the orchestra, the American orchestra field, um, and so that's that's where I really think we need to uh, to address change. Um, the way that our orchestras are structured is really reliant, heavily reliant on contributed income, and that's not because it's a broken model. That's just the nature of the beast. It still takes four players to play a quartet, uh, just as it did in Beethoven's day. And so costs are going to rise, and there have been you know, academic research done about this, that costs are always going to outpace revenue uh, in, in, in terms of that. And that's why you need that contributed income to fill that gap. That's why you need an endowment to fill that gap. It's just a labor-intensive business. You know, heart surgery, you know, you, you, you need quite a few people to be able to do heart surgery just like you did, you know, 40 years ago. Um, right. and, and so the, these are labor intensive industries that suffer from this sort of cost imbalance and that's okay. It's, it's not, it's not something that has to be changed where orchestras have to really adapt and evolve. And I would use the word evolve there is in not relying on external forces to create enough demand for us to be able to, to serve our communities. We need to create the demand ourselves. And, you know, Apple invented the iPhone in, in 2007 we didn't know that we needed an iPhone in 2007. It just it came out, and now you can't live without one. That's creating demand. Uh, orchestras don't create demand. We sell to existing demand. And in order for us to thrive in the future, we need to change that. So so the business model is really relying on, you know, ticket revenue is a big part, but not the biggest part. Contributed yep. revenue is the biggest part. And then those organizations have had, have had enough foresight to build a really healthy endowment. Uh, that, that should be a very, pretty big contributor as well. Yeah. And that's a, a lot of great, great points. And do you think, um, I mean, I was going to talk about this a little later, but do you, what, what kind of steps do you think we need to take to build that demand? Cause I feel like at least in America, it's, it's, it's fascinating talking to friends and colleagues who play in orchestras in uh, Mexico or in Europe or <laughs> the, the fabric of, or, or the, Classical music and live concerts is woven into the culture in Europe, in Mexico, in in other countries, and here it's just not. Right. And and I wonder how that changes, and how do you feel that classical music fits into 
the fabric of American life. Because I think that when people experience it, if they've never experienced it before, it's something that changes you. And I don't just say that as someone who's in the industry and I want people to come to concerts. <laughs> I say that, yeah, yeah, I say that because it's just you, there's nothing that can replicate the experience of being in a concert hall and hearing a live orchestra. There's, you can't, you know, you can watch it, you can build a movie theater in your house and watch a movie at home without going yeah. to the theater. You can't do that with an orchestra. And so, w- how do you think that it currently fits in? the fabric of culture and life in America. Well, I love the way that you talk about that because going to a, going to an orchestra concert, we just did Prokofiev five last week and the Shostakovich five a couple of weeks before that. Mm-hmm. And th- those really big sonic, you know, monumental works, y- you cannot reproduce those on a stereo. I mean, you just can't. It's like, it's like seeing the ocean for the first time or going to the Grand Canyon. You know, you can get great photography but you're never going to reproduce that experience. And we are fortunate enough to have uh, an art form that you have to experience live. And, and so it's a, matter of, it's a matter of sharing what that experience is without talking about it like everybody's already familiar with who these people are. Think about the way that we promote concerts right now. We, we will, you know, we, let's take the Shostakovich Five. We'll say we're having it. You know, we're doing Shostakovich Five. It was this, you know, big work, and Shostakovich had this, you know, thing with Stalin, and it was terrible, and everything else, and um, and this was his way of redeeming himself, and all this other historical stuff that nobody cares about. We will put a picture of a guest artist you've never heard of with fancy hair mm-hmm. on, a, on a brochure, and we expect these to sell tickets to a, a to a public that's largely unfamiliar with what we do. And the reason that they're largely unfamiliar is is because we've had a diminishing relationship with symphonic music over the course of really since the 60s, I would say, um, where, you know, the silent generation, let's say, and these are people that are currently in their 70s and 80s and 90s. The silent generation, when they were in their 30s and 40s, had a much different relationship with symphonic music than I've been able to enjoy in my lifetime. It was it was more it was more like what you describe in Europe and Mexico and, and other places. It was more woven into the culture. It's more just easily accessible. It's it's very present in the in the public school system. It's you know you you turn on the television and you might be able to see a, a concert, and, and we haven't had that, uh, and it's because of a lack of well because of a lot a lot of things a, a lot of competition a lack of funding a lack of you know a lack of foresight into how to really make this. Um, become part of the fabric of our communities. And so I would say it's not part of the fabric of our communities right now. And in those cities that are fortunate enough to have a professional symphony orchestra at the moment, you know, those cities that have it serve such a tiny percentage of our populations on a regular basis that, that, that you have to scratch your head and wonder how they can, how they can pull that off. Um, the, you know, Indianapolis, Kansas City, you know, a, a lot of cities that have that have a major symphony orchestra in their in their city. If you look at the regular attendance, the people that are coming at least once a year to a classical music concert, it's it's a fraction of a percent. Uh, it, and, and so what that tells you is like ninety nine point eight percent of the community doesn't come to your classical music, which is mostly what you do. And so the opportunity there to move that needle and and the difference between, you know, what I would call existential threat and happy sustainability, the difference relative to our market is really small. And so we need to get beyond the fact that this is a sinking ship. We need to get beyond the fact that there's nothing we can do to build demand for this classical music art form. And we need to start to realize that there are ways that we can change our futures in a really big way. And it doesn't take a Herculean effort to do it. It, it, it requires more more diligence and thinking about how we promote classical music as something that has to be part of your life so that people are attracted to come to these programs like you and I are. Um, it's just most of the community just isn't familiar with that. Yeah, and I'd say even in the larger cities, I mean, I'm, the last time I went to the Met, I never forget, everyone around me had subtitles in different languages, which to me told me that they were all not from New York. Um, yeah. not necessarily, but you know, I mean, you know, it's not every day you see someone reading German subtitles, you know, on the, in the back of their seat. And so it was, it's interesting that like not even the big cities really have that the, the, 
the market share is there, you know, like the, the potential market is still there, even in the large places. Um, yeah. so it's, it's fascinating how you talk about that. And I think too, like the, the opportunity is there. It's just, nobody's seized it yet. And I think about sports because obviously sports is incredibly woven in the fabric of everyone's life. Um, even if you aren't a sports person, I mean, everybody watches the Super Bowl for the we just had that last night for the commercials or the halftime show or whatever. There's a lot of eyes on football, but when you think about it, the barrier to entry for watching a football game is actually relatively high. Uh, when you think about all the rules and all this stuff, I mean, if you get someone who doesn't know how to play football or how the rules of football works, it's an incredibly confusing thing to watch yet. Somehow it's still, uh, prevalent and people talk about the barrier for classical music being high you don't need to have any understanding of something to appreciate it. Uh, to classical music, at least, you know, artwork, same thing. You can take with it, take from it whatever you want. So I think that that's one of the narratives that needs to change is like the barrier to entry for a classical concert is high. It's not. You just go and sit down and listen to music. Everyone can do that. Well, the number of people that apologize to me for not knowing more about classical music is remarkable. You yeah. know, any conversation I have with a concert goer, they'll say, well, I don't know very much about it, but... And, and this, this is a gift. This is a, in, in my, in my belief, this is a spiritual gift. I mean, this is part, this is woven into our DNA. Like you can't not be moved by this music to, to hear it live. And maybe you don't enjoy sitting in a concert for two and a half hours quietly and not knowing where to clap. And you're not sure of the whole you know, uh, audience experience. Um, may, maybe there are issues with that, but fundamentally the opportunity to hear the climax of a major symphony in person is unbelievable and you don't need any education to 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 understand that and, and so the fact that we're reaching such a sliver of our communities right now uh with this art that's really you know like going to the grand canyon like seeing the ocean for the first time hearing a major symphony for the first time is that kind of experience and when i take somebody and i this is one of my favorite things to do is to take somebody that's never been to a symphony orchestra concert before, a professional symphony orchestra concert before, in a great hall. We we have a you know one of the finest places for yeah. classical music making in the world here, mm -hmm. and and so to have somebody in that hall with me, and to see their reaction to something like a Bruckner Seven, or something like a Shostakovich, or or, or anything. Honestly, I, I like to go sort of early 20th century. That, yeah. That's sort of the, the sweet spot where people really, their eyes open because they haven't heard those pieces before. And invariably, there will, will be an expression of awe. Their jaw will be open. They, they might have tears in their eyes, something. And they'll say to me, where has this been all my life? Like, I right. didn't know this was a thing. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and so I like it because I get to relive my first time through through their ears, through their eyes, and, and to be able to to experience that again, and so that sort of just sharing sharing what this art is. We don't need everybody to subscribe. I, I know that our industry has had a lot of conversation around the subscription model. Is it dead? Is it whatever? Who who cares? Mm -hmm. Like the idea is that we're getting a sliver of the community to come to our concert right now, and we need more than a sliver, uh, both to fulfill our mission and also to fulfill our our business requirements. Um, right. And, and, and so we need to find ways of expressing, of persuading people to, to try us uh, in a way of, of, of setting up that expectations for experience that connect to people's emotions so that people feel like this really needs to be part of my life in some way. Even if I come once a year, this needs to be a part of my life. Right. So what do you think that currently, I, I mean, I know that obviously the landscape has changed a lot. I mean, you know, it used to be recordings and touring and all that stuff and, and that stuff still happens. But I think that, you know, the orchestras have kind of shifted since, you know, probably the sixties and seventies and there's doing more stuff at home and more community engagement and more streaming and more media and stuff like that necessarily. Um, so what do you think orchestras currently are doing well in terms of accomplishing this, of reaching more people and, and, attacking that market share? Well, I, I do think, you know, and so in classical music, maybe we're not doing very well in that area right now, but we have really broadened uh, what it means to be a symphony orchestra. And the versatility of symphony orchestras is really expanding over the last decade. Um, the, the fact that our pops charts have gotten so much better in recent yeah, years, right. the fact that these, 
you know, blockbuster film, like the idea of doing Star Wars with live orchestra. Can you imagine what an orchestra's response would have been to that, to that 10 years ago? Right. I mean, no way can I play for 54 minutes straight in Return of the Jedi. That's not going to happen. Right. <laughs> And so I, I think orchestras have become more adaptive, more more versatile in, in their willingness to take on projects like these. Um, and because of that, there's more product being created because we're demanding the product from from the from the creators. And so I think that that's been a very positive move uh, from orchestras in, in recent years. And we need to continue moving in that direction to 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 try to improve the quality of everything, uh, not just the classical focus. You know, the idea of playing footballs behind. You know, you know, Johnny has been artist or whatever. Those days are gone. Uh, right. we're, we're, we're getting to, to higher quality works that are more attractive and show off the orchestra as an instrument uh, in a better way. Yeah, it's you know, it's it's interesting because I, I read a lot of articles and um, and this is not me attacking anybody, but I read a lot of articles and it's particularly with people who have left the industry. They say I'm done with my career in music. Orchestras need to change. They, it's always this article, orchestras need to change, they're not doing this well, they're not doing this well. But I almost never see any sort of suggestion on like how to fix it or any timeline on what that might look like. Because I think the biggest thing is things slowly change. I mean, it doesn't, you can't just all of a sudden change the concert format for every concert and expect a positive response. Um, it's gonna be a mixed bag. So slowly introducing things here and there what kind of things do you think we can slowly introduce to make it more attractive to more people? Yeah, Sam, I really do love the way you think about all this. You're, you're I phenomenal. think about it probably too much. <laughs> oh, yeah? Yeah. Well, I, I, I mean, you're a phenomenal musician and a phenomenal clarinetist, but, but also the thought leadership you're exhibiting here. I mean, we need more people like you. We need people taking thought leadership positions and not just listening to the few people that are vocal about things and then parroting back what they say. We need, we need original thought in this field. And so I think that's step one is original thought and it can't be, you know, we're going to change the dress code to this concert. Okay, fine. We're not going to wear tails anymore. We're going to wear something slightly more casual. Great. And, <laughs> that's but that's a good thing. Either. I mean, I'm, it's, it's a good and, thing. Yeah. And, uh, you know, not to, not to, I mean, I think that is a positive change for sure, but I don't think, yeah. you know, to your point, I don't think that's going to like sell more tickets, you know, <laughs> I well, mean, it, it's, it's lots of little things though. It, it's, it's, right. it's our attitude about the concert experience itself. And I, I think for us, you know, we have, we, we have that sliver of the community, but that sliver of the community is supporting us on their shoulders. I mean, they are carrying the weight. Think, think mm -hmm. about your top tier of donors and how much of the weight of the organization they carry on their shoulders. It, it's, it's amazing. And right. so they are incredibly devoted to us. And so we can't make a dramatic right turn that says we're going to, you know, we're going to stop presenting guest artists this year or, <laughs> or, right. or we're, we're not going to have intermissions anymore or whatever it is. You have to recognize that people have different motivations for attending concerts and they have different desires in, in, in experiencing them. And so we have to be patient uh, with our changes. But I do think before we start messing around with the, the product, you know, and people hate yeah. when I call it the product, but I mean, that's again, going is. back to a business, that's what we're, that's what we're yeah. doing. And so, you know, before you start messing around with that, why don't we create more demand for what we do? Why don't we create any demand for what we do instead of relying on our public school systems, on Spotify, on whatever it is external to us, to create some need for this in people's in people's lives, I, I think that there's a way to do it. I think creativity is a big way, uh, and and so here at Kansas City Symphony, we're getting ready to launch a big initiative that's meant to drive um, drive demand for classical music, really focused on creativity, tying in data science. There is so much in the technology sphere that we have not taken advantage of, mm -hmm. and 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 so orchestras I think have quite a lot of low hanging fruit that can be picked. Uh, just by following some practices that other industries have been following for quite some time now. Um, and and then I think thinking about more about the experience of concert attendance and uh, maybe before you start messing with the Overture Concerto Symphony model, which maybe we want to mess with that too, mm -hmm. um, but, but think about what it means to attend a concert and what that pre and post concert experience should be. What is the, what is the 
audience need to hear before and after and two weeks after? What do they need to hear six weeks before a concert? And it can't just be flashing up the same marketing sales messages uh, that, that, that we say. Right. Yeah. Um, th there, there's a metaphor I share sometimes that kind of annoys people. So I'm going to see if it annoys you. Um, <laughs> but, but, I'll be all right. Yeah. I, I imagine, you know, folks over at Colgate, they sell toothpaste, right? And so imagine they sell toothpaste the way that orchestras sell classical music. They would say, uh, it, you know, it'd be some cliched description. It's minty fresh. Buy it today. Or they might tell you the, tell you about the historical significance of the toothbrush to oral care. Uh, or they might just tell you that the toothpaste is on sale. That's akin to what orchestras are doing right now with right. classical music. And, and so Colgate, they don't do it that way. They show a picture of a guy kissing a girl, or they show the like confidence. Guy's that you teeth running out. Yeah. E e well, yeah. yeah. <laughs> or, or or they show the confidence of a bright white smile when you're getting ready to give a, a presentation to a room, a boardroom, or something like that. You know, it's it, it's creating, it's using story, it's using emotion to try to connect people to what we do. And what we do is all about emotion. I mean, this is all about yeah. the shared experience, the human experience. It transcends culture and race and ethnicity and education and class and every other thing that divides us right now. Music brings us together. And so let's use, let's promote music in that way. And, and so it's not going to be easy, but there is some low hanging fruit out there. I know that there is. Uh, and it's just requires a concerted effort to, to, to do it. Well, I look forward to seeing what that initiative looks like um, from your end. I know I follow you on, on social media and the Kansas City Symphony. I have some friends there. So I'll, I'll look forward to seeing kind of what, what you guys have come up with and, and, and how that, that works out. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is, and did, were you here when Jacob Joyce was here? I couldn't, I can't yeah. remember. Okay. Yeah. So Jacob, uh, you know, he's, I don't know if I've ever met someone who's more passionate about classical music, not just music, but classical music. Um, and he's a, he's our con, a resident conductor, and he said something to me one time really profound. And he's like, he's like, I'm tired of people apologizing for classical music. Like we shouldn't. Like I don't think the product needs to change. Like I don't think dumbing down a concert and like talking before every piece or. Um, you know, having some visual element is is necessarily going to make it more accessible for somebody. And I don't think we ever need to apologize for having or playing classical music at a high level. And I think he really put that on display this past weekend. He did a Valentine's Day concert. First time he's ever done a Pops concert with us. And the last piece we played, and I was a little worried about this, but it was, you know, we played most of the Romeo and Juliet Tchaikovsky Overture. And, mm. you know, it was like 13 minutes of just straight playing and it was incredible, the audience response after it. And these are people that come to pop shows, so they're not really all that familiar with it. And he just unabashedly like did not apologize for having classical music on the, the pops program. And I thought it was really effective. And I think, um, you know, that's something that we need to take into account is like, you don't need to apologize for the product. Like, oh, I'm sorry, there's classical music on this concert. Like... You know, we'll get to the Frank Sinatra later. No, it's like this is a major part of what we do, and that doesn't need to change, in my right. opinion. Um, okay, done with my my little uh, <laughs> soliloquy there. Sorry. Um, so going back to kind of like your role as the CEO, um, I think there are, in my view, you could argue four, but there there are three probably major constituencies in a in an orchestra. So you have obviously the management and the musicians and the board of directors. I would say I would argue the fourth would probably be the music director because that person he or she is is typically it doesn't really fit into any one of those. They kind of oversee all of them. So obviously this is a tricky balance. And I talked to one of your colleagues, Mark Niehaus about this. And he said, there's really no way to make everyone happy at the same time. Cause somebody's always going, there's always a give and take. So, <laughs> you know, you know what I mean? Like you can't, yeah. you, you, you do one thing and the musicians are upset. You do another thing and the management has to work, mm. you know, way too hard. Or you do one thing and the board's mad cause they just want this. So how do you find that balance in your everyday job? It's, immeasurably difficult in my opinion. Yeah, I, I would, I would challenge that actually. Um, okay. I, I, I think, I think if there needs to be a balance, it means you're not all aligned, you know? So, sure. so you're, you're each going for competing. You each have competing priorities. 
Right. And we should all be aligned. Why, why, why shouldn't we? Um, why shouldn't the musicians, yeah. the management and the board and the music director all want exactly the same thing? Mm-hmm. I mean, it, it, it helps all of us. It helps our individual careers. It helps our organizations. It helps our paychecks. It helps the stability of our, or, uh, it makes our, our concerts feel better because they're fuller. Um, right. like why shouldn't we all want exactly the same thing? And, and so I, I would challenge that if, if, those three groups or four groups that you mentioned aren't aren't playing nicely together <laughs> or somebody's always going to be unhappy, it's because they're not all aligned to a common purpose. And the only way we're going to solve these really existential issues is to get aligned. Uh, and, and so, you, and we so really, would you say that, sorry to interrupt, so would you say that like your your goal uh, with this is to get everyone on the same page and everyone aligned and, and um, you know, because that's probably the, the way that you succeed and grow. Well, well, it is, and that's how you—that's who you really sort of get the flywheel moving. I—I I mm-hmm. love Jim Collins. I don't know if you've ever read any Jim Collins, Sam, but you would—you uh, would right. enjoy it. Okay. Uh, re- re- read a book here. I'm gonna pull it off the shelf. Sure. Yeah. Uh, good to great. Best right. book ever written. Okay. <laughs> I this. will. I will absolutely check yeah. that out. Um, it's the idea. You, you know what a flywheel is? Uh. You can explain it to me. It's a, a mechanical store of energy. So you've got this big, heavy wheel. Sure. You know, it's sitting on an axis. And it's really hard to get the thing moving. But once you get the wheel moving, it starts to spin on its own, and then it becomes really hard to stop. And when you get an organization totally aligned around a common purpose, uh, and, and, and like really intellectually and, you know, emotionally and everything else invested in that common purpose together, then it becomes hard to stop the momentum of the organization. And that's when great things start to happen. And so that's what that book is all about. There's a whole lot more to it. Awesome. That, that, yeah. that, that's what that book is about. And, and, and so it, it, it's really the idea that we all need to get working uh, in, in sync with each other. We all need to be rowing at the same time together towards the same goal. You shouldn't have to choose between being a clarinetist and being able to impact major change in your organization. Those should be one and the same. Because you're you're one of the you're one of the uh, again using a metaphor that nobody likes you're one of the product engineers you're one of the <laughs> ones who makes the stuff right <laughs> and so um, you, you're contributing to the art of the organization and so you are a critical voice in any conversation and so the the board the management the musicians and the music director and the CEO and everybody else need to be working together because we really only have one constituency and and, and that that's our community. Right. Yeah. You know, we, we are a cultural service agency. We are entrusted with community resources to be able to deliver this particular version of art uh, into our communities. And there are lots of different forms of art. Other art forms have their champions. Our job is to be the champion for symphonic music. And so we need to all get serious about that and, and, and working together on that. And, and so I, I think that balancing all those different groups that you mentioned if they're all rowing in the same direction, then there's there there shouldn't be conflict. There's always going to be issues. Although it's going to be different points of view. Of course. And 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 so from a pragmatic standpoint, getting, you know, being transparent, um, making sure everybody has the same information, um, making sure that you're including people at the table when you're making decisions. Um, I, I I think those are really important. Uh, and, and it's not going to be fairy dust. I mean, we're not always going to all agree on of everything. Course. But, but that's okay. That, that's how good decisions get made is that you have really thoughtful people at the table operating from the same set of information uh, with different points of view. And then, and then out, of that, out of that, good things will happen. Yeah, and I think, too, to this point, I think it's also getting, getting the right people at the table, um, getting the people yeah. that you trust, getting the people that uh, are independent thinkers, and collectively you can come up with decisions that, you know, like you said, maybe not everyone agrees with, but you know, you keep the flywheel moving in the right direction and, you know, maybe you won't take my idea this time, but next time maybe, maybe my idea is the one that's going to work out for, for everybody. Um, yeah. Yeah. And there's, you know, there, there's ways to compose committees and there's, you know, decisions that are made for committees and decisions that shouldn't be made by committees and, and everything else. Um, that, that, but, but, you know, again, in that book, good to great, uh, there's a, a thing about getting the right people on the bus, number one, right. and then yeah. putting them in the right seats. And so it's really a matter of having the right people at the table at the right time um, to to be able to to make progress as an organization. 
Yeah. And so how would you describe, and I, and I hate to put this in a box because I think it's it's kind of bullshit, to be honest. Sorry, <laughs> language, but it's my podcast, so I can say whatever I want. You can do um, that. <laughs> um, but I, you know, I, there's always this this thing about like different leadership styles and for I'll describe mine first. I mean, and I'm not necessarily like a leader uh, in a position like you, but you know, I, I'm a leader in certain respects, and and I always like to make sure that um, I delegate as much as possible, and then sort of make the final decision uh, with input from others as sort of my leadership style. Because I, if if people can take pride in what they're doing and feel like their work is uh, being respected and heard and listened to then they're just going to do better work. I mean, it's just, I think it's just a fact. Um, and so, you know, I know, I know other people like to be more hands-on and they like to be involved with what people are doing. Um, so I was just curious, like, what do you, what do you think your leadership style is? Hmm. Uh, I, I, I will distill it down to a few words. Uh, sure. the first is the first is creativity. Uh, creativity is something that's beaten out of us through our public school system. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Um, big proponent of Ken Robinson. If you've never never heard his TED talk, go go okay. check that out. Um, all right. But but the idea that all of us used to be creative when we were when we were little, and then over time we we tend not to use those muscles anymore, and we stop being creative. And the solutions to our field, this uh, the, the way we can improve the uh, basically the up, uptake of our art is through creativity. And so I really try to inspire a culture of creativity. Um, some organizations no names. Some, some organizations are like going to work at the Muppet show. It's really exciting. It's really chaotic. Other organizations <laughs> are, are like going to work at a bank and, and it's very businesslike and it's very, you know, just rinse and repeat over and over again. Uh, and, and so whatever the culture of the organization is, there has to be un, an undercurrent of creativity from all levels of it. Just like you can't delegate strategic thinking and strategic planning to, to one person, you know, a director of strategic planning or something like that. It, it has to permeate the organization at all layers. Uh, creativity has to permeate the uh, organization at all layers. And then the next thing I'll say is ownership. And this goes to your point of delegation. Um, everybody has to have their own piece of the farm and, and whatever that is at whatever level of the organization is, if you're going to hire people, you have to be able to trust them to do things. And so that means ceding some control, <laughs> which right. is difficult for some people. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but, but that's, that's something I've, I've, I've developed, uh, been consciously working on developing that over the last 10 or 20 years, uh, to really, you know, give people part their, their piece of the farm and let them run it. Um, but making sure that everybody's uh, pieces are working together in a coordinated fashion. Yeah, that's terrific. Um, and I think, you know, your track record speaks for itself. I, I was, I was loving seeing all the things that you were doing last year during the pandemic. I don't know, last year, two years ago, whenever it was, it just feels like it's been nine years now, but, um, yeah. <laughs> um, and, and I love, uh, following what you're doing. And, uh, I just think that, um, Kansas city is becoming a place where people are looking to, and, you know, I always looked at the new world symphony as, as another place that, that people are looking towards just for the future of, of, orchestras and, and how things are run and, and how we sort of spark that creativity and how we develop audiences and everything. And I think Kansas City's absolutely becoming one of those places. So I look forward to continuing to watch your career from uh, from a few hundred miles away. Sure. And uh, and uh, I'd love to, you know, maybe if I ever get a job at the Kansas City Symphony, we could build a podcast studio and, uh, you know, do the have the, uh, have that creativity going in, in the, in the Kaufman center. I think that'd be fun. Oh, that would be fun, Sam. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, Danny, thank you so much for your time today. I think it was a really fascinating conversation. I, I I'm definitely going to share this one far and wide. I think that, uh, you have a lot of great thoughts and, um, I will absolutely check out that book that you recommended to me. That's, that sounds fantastic. And, uh, yeah, thanks so much for your time. I know you're a busy guy, so I really appreciate you being here. Great. Thanks, Sam. Really appreciate everything you're contributing to the field. Absolutely. Thanks so much. So for more information about myself and the Candid Clarinetist podcast, please be sure to follow us on Instagram at the Candid Clarinetist or drop by our website at candidclarinetistpodcast.com. Once again, my name is Sam Rothstein, and thanks for tuning in to the Candid Clarinetist podcast.